This is a Geek Leader Podcast, and I'm your host, John Rauta. This show is all about helping us grow as leaders, become better technologists, and improve our lives both at work and at home. I hope you enjoy the show and learn a lot. Welcome to a Geek Leader Podcast. I'm your host, John Rauta. And if you could, please do me a favor and take a moment and leave a rating and review in whatever podcast player you're listening to this on, whether it's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Heart Radio, doesn't matter. I'd greatly appreciate it, and that feedback really helps get other listeners to the show. Also, if you're not subscribed, go ahead and subscribe so you don't miss an episode. And if you feel so inclined, you can go to agutor.com slash tip and donate to the show. Thanks so much. All right, you leaders, today I'm honored to have Jeff got help on the show, and uh, we're going to talk about uh, lean UX. We're going to talk about uh, OKRs. We're going to talk about customer centric uh, product development, which is always really cool. And Jeff is a leader in this uh, space, uh, speaker, educator, and coach. And anyway, with all that being said, Jeff, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, John. It's great to be here. Yeah, if you don't mind, just tell the audience a bit about your background and kind of how you got into this space uh, to begin with. So I started off with kind of the, in the early days of the web. So then in the, in the first dot com bubble as a, um, as a, as a graphic designer and uh, kind of a web, web developer is probably a, uh, kind of a, an inflated job title. I mean, I did <laughs> HTML, you know, like that yeah. was, uh, that's what, that's what we did back then. Um, and then I moved into, uh, design using kind of fully into the design user experience design, UI design, product design, et cetera. Um, and as the web got more complicated and more more powerful and more interactive, uh, those jobs became more interesting and more challenging. Eventually, I moved into team leadership, and um, and then finally a bit of entrepreneurial uh, efforts. I started a, a design uh, product design development studio with two colleagues in New York, and then ultimately, in the, for the last decade or so, I've been out on my own, um, working independently as a as a coach and a consultant and a trainer. But uh, I mean, my my foundations are in. You know, sort of the the super early days of uh, of the commercial web. Anyway, yeah, that's very similar to how I started. Me and uh, two friends from college back in the late nineties started a web design and development company, and kind of you know morphed into hosting and network support services. Because you know, as as you're new, and you don't have that many customers. Your good customers say, "Hey, can you come, uh, you know, work on my Windows server?" And you just try to figure it out. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's, that's interesting. Uh, so when you got into, you know, UX and, uh, well, first off for people that are more on the, the back end things, what is UX exactly? You know, a lot of people think it's design, but, but it's more than that. So if you don't mind, just explain a little bit about what that is and, uh, how you got into the customer focus side of that. Sure. I mean, user ex- UX stands for user experience. Now, mm-hmm. Typically that's, there's going to be some kind of a, of a, of a function followed by like a UX designer or UX copywriter um, I've even heard UX engineer, uh, which I don't really know what that is, but essentially folks who work in, in UX and user experience are, are tasked with designing the, the interaction of a, of a system, the workflow of a system, the, 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 you know, the, the, the logic perhaps of the, of the, of the steps it takes to complete tasks in the system we talk about copywriting and content strategy as perhaps part of the UX and design umbrella. There's research components that are in there. Ultimately, there's graphic and visual design elements in that, although n- most UX designers are not visual or UI designers, right? That, that Certainly, you can find folks who can do both, but a lot of folks who work in UX are really focused on connecting the dots between, you know, if you think, if you think about how you buy something on Amazon, for example, right? The steps it takes to search for something and the logic with which that search, the search results are presented to you and then the product page and where the buttons are and then, you know, completing the task. All those decisions are made by UX designers. Right. So more like the process that the user is going to flow through, the wireframes that they're going to see going that path, not necessarily like the the colors and the font choices. Exactly. It's the customer journey. It's really thinking through and 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 designing the customer journey from from one point in the system to another point, that could be from the moment you you enter it to the moment you exit, or or you know sl- you know slices of that user journey along the way. Mm. Yeah, and you know one of the things that when you go back to the early days of uh, software engineering, a lot of that was done by the software developers themselves because they're just building something based off of a, a list of requirements back then. Before we got into you know really using Scrum and going in a more agile approach, but as that kind of evolved, we 
at least from my perspective, we learned that we kind of needed somebody that was specialized just in those processes and understanding how how the user experience is changing. You know, we went from, you know, always having desktops to mobile first development, things like that. How have you seen that that career path of a UX designer change over the last few years? You know, it's interesting. You know, when I started my career, the web was static. And generally speaking, the websites that we built mimicked org charts. Yeah, like brochure sites. Back then. Exactly. It was it was it was a hundred percent brochureware, right? It was like this is our legal department. Here's photos of all of our <laughs> in house counsel. You know, and it was fascinating stuff. But as as the web became more interactive and uh, and more useful, right? The 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 design became a lot more um, challenging, right? Mm-hmm. Whereas before there there was it, it was basically information architecture work. Right, which is actually my first job title was information architect, um, and and the idea was kind of how do you how do you organize and and display the information in a way that makes sense, and then as as the web became more interactive, there was workflow components. How do you sign up for an event? How do you put? How do you buy something online? How do you apply for a mortgage? And as you think through that, the complexities grow and grow. So you're going from sort of information design to interaction design. And then ultimately there are elements, again, like there's there's elements of, of of really deeply understanding the customer that are core to doing the job well. And so that's going to require um research skills and what we call customer discovery, which is, you know, uh, uh, you know, t- talking to customers, creating prototypes and showing that to them, running experiments with customers, doing all kinds of, of exercises to learn more about how they think about completing these tasks and how the work that you're doing is or isn't meeting those expectations. Right. So you're talking about like doing doing surveys and A-B testing and things like that to see the actual usage of what you're building versus how maybe you thought they were going to use it. Certainly those are parts of the work as well, yeah. yes. So um, what exactly is customer-centric product development? Because that's a term that um, you don't hear a whole lot, at least I don't hear a whole lot in um, in, in my industry when it comes to um, development, but I think it's one of those newer things that that people are starting to focus on. So, what's interesting is that for years, organizations, I'd say, I would say for decades, what companies have focused on is feature centric product development, which yes. is we're going to build this thing and it's going to do five things. It's going to have these five features, these five capabilities, and when we delivered those five capabilities, we were done. Right, the definition of done was works as designed. And that was great, right? Assuming that there was a need for the thing that you built and assuming that people were actually looking for this thing that you built and assuming that they found it and assuming that they would try it and that they would use it and that they would use it again and again and again and tell their friends and give you money and all of those things. And that's a massive set of assumptions. In other words, super risky, right? This idea that if we build it, they will come particularly as the web expanded and just became universal and and you know anybody literally anybody could put up a a competing service to yours in a matter of of days or weeks or months meant that simply delivering features was no longer the measure of success and this was made doubly painful by the introduction of continuous deployment right so if you've got systems where uh, the, the nature of software fundamentally changed, right? When continuous deployment and cont- the kind of DevOps became the default for product development because we we no longer had an end to the systems that we built, mm-hmm. right? So when, when I started working professionally, software came in a box. You went to the store and you bought a, you know, a box of Microsoft Office or whatever it was, you know, or I worked right. at America Online. We shipped you a box of software once a month. You're welcome for that, by the way. You know, um, and and if you think about that that sort of model today, um, you know, you don't go to the store and buy a box of Netflix, right? That just sounds silly, or a box yeah. of Instagram or of Google Maps, right? Like that doesn't make any sense, right? The software that we build today is continuous, and so and then and then you look at sort of the digitally native companies that are out there today, the leaders, right? The Fang companies, right? The Facebooks, the Amazons, the Alphabets, et cetera. Um, you know, Amazon ships code to production every single second. That's a fact, right? If you can ship code to production every single second, the the act of delivering a feature to market becomes a non-event. 
right? And so feature-centered development no longer makes sense if if the thing that's driving the work is a non-event, right? So what is value in a world where you can deliver a feature to market every second? Value is, did you improve the life of the customer that you serve? Did you make them more successful? Did you make it easier, faster, more efficient, simpler for them to do the thing that they're trying to do? And and the interesting part about that and what makes that different is that the definition of done changes, right? The definition of done in feature-centric development is works as designed, right? We have a sign-up form. It has this many fields. And when you submit it, it validates the fields and you get signed up, right? In customer-centric development, we have uh, human behavior, right? Outcomes as the measure of success. Did people find the form? Did they complete the form? Did they error out? How many errors? Did they try again? Did they give up, right? How, like, what's the percentage of success? And the interesting thing about that definition of done and definition of success is that it's not binary, right? Which makes it more difficult to measure, which makes it more difficult to manage. But that's what customer-centric product development is a very long story to get there, is that we're focused on what the customer is trying to do and, we're, and, and our measure of success is, did we make it easier for them to do that? Right. So um, you mentioned, yeah, measuring outcomes is kind of a difficult thing to do. And I know one of the tools that we've used in the past and other people have definitely used to, to try to measure that is OKRs. Can, can you explain a little bit about what OKRs are and how maybe they're helpful in this? Yeah, area? absolutely. In fact, I wrote a whole book about this. <laughs> it, it just came out about a month ago. It's called Who Does What by How Much? It's co-written by my longtime co-author, Josh Seiden. Um, and I highly recommend you pick up a copy because it is, it's really a practical guide to doing this. But I will sum it up very, very quickly at a very high level for you. Objectives and key results is a team-based goal-setting framework, and it's not new. It's been around for 40 years at least. Andy Grove at Intel invented it, and, and they've been running it at a variety of Silicon Valley companies and, and around the world for a long time. Um, about eight years ago, a guy named John Doerr, very famous venture capitalist, um, wrote a book called Measure What Matters and made OKRs very popular in the business world. Now, what's interesting is that Door doesn't get particularly specific about what an objective is or what a key result is or what good looks like. He's just got some really, you know, big brand name case studies, Google and Bono and um, and other sort of very big names that are that have used this to be successful. So what is it? It's a team-based goal setting framework made up of two parts, an objective and a key result. Mm -hmm. The objective is a qualitative statement that declares the customer benefit we'd like to see in the world when we finish working, right? Our definition of success is a qualitative benefit to the customer that we'd like to see in the future. So we want to create the easiest way to buy furniture online by the end of 2025, right? The, 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 the most efficient way to book a Mediterranean cruise, right? In the tourism industry by the end of the year. I would like that one. I, I, knew, I, I knew you would. <laughs> hence, hence I, I used that one, right? But that's what we're talking about, right? What, what's, sort of, what's the qualitative customer benefit that we'd like to see in the world? That's the first habit. That's the objective. The key results answer the question, how will we know that we've achieved that objective? And so the key results are metrics, but specifically they are outcomes. They are measures of human behavior. And so the way that we know that we've created the most efficient way to book a Mediterranean cruise in, in the tourism industry by, by the end of the year is um, we've reduced the time it takes um, on average for a user to book a cruise from, you know, by, by 80%, right? We have um, increased the cruise booking completion rate by 90%. We've reduced the amount of calls to the call center for people asking for help to complete their booking by 25%, right? And what you'll notice is that in each one of those key results, we are measuring human behavior. And the way that you know that you've written a key result that measures human behavior is it answers the question, who does what by how much, which is the name of our book. That's why we named the book that. So when you get to that point where you're creating, okay, well, well oh, actually, let's back up a little bit. How do you know you have a well-written OKR, because that's one of the things that I've struggled with is 
you know, whenever you kind of roll out the use of OKRs to your team for the first time, they're not written very well. Yeah. So first of all, the first red flag is that there should be no features in neither your objective nor your key results, right? So there should be nothing in there that talks about what you're going to build. And that's what makes this different, right? Again, so there's no, there's no features, there's no solutions, there's no campaigns, there's no activities or tasks, right? We're not looking for any of that stuff that your people are going to be doing. Yeah, that's a good point. That's usually what I see is you see like the traditional goals. You see like, you know, we're going to, you know, create a new, um, I don't know, uh, e-commerce shopping cart <laughs> experience. Yeah. Yeah, something like that. Right. And and, and that happens a lot. And that's because we're used to thinking that way, yes. right? We're used to imagining our work that way. And we're used to getting our work that way, right? Then build me this this shopping cart. You know, the, the other sort of thing that people try to do is to sneak through features in their OKRs is they'll say something like, create the ability to search for a product, right? Something like, anytime you see that, like the ability to do something, that's a feature, right? That's a, another red flag. So one of the biggest red flags in, in OKR writing is no features whatsoever. Number one, let's, let's get those out of there because that's the whole purpose. That's what makes this different, right? That's what that is, is that the goal is not to deliver a feature. The goal is to make it easier and faster for you to book a Mediterranean cruise online, right? That's the goal. And the interesting thing about that is that now the team that has to achieve that goal has an entire, a much broader set of options for how to achieve that goal. If you came to those te- that team and you said, look, I want you to, to build this form with these questions and in this order, they would build it, right? I'm sure they'd build it well and it would work well and it would be high performance and secure, et cetera, and all those things, right? Um, but if you said, listen, I just need you to help get people through this process more efficiently and, you know, and I, I want them calling the call center less um, because they, they're struggling to to complete the form, right? Well, now the team gets to go figure out, well, where are people getting stuck? What's keeping them from being successful? Why do they call the call center? And then, and then experimenting with a variety of different ways to improve the user experience, mm-hmm. right? And so when they find that correct combination or the best combination of code, copy, and design that drives the behavior change they're looking for, they can go and double down and build on that because they never committed to a specific feature. They committed to a behavior change. And so that's what OKRs are. And, and that's kind of how the work differs once those goals are in place. Um, but you did ask me for some anti-patterns, right? So I'm sorry. So no yes. features in there. I got, I got lost there for a second. Um, no features, number one. Um, no metrics in your objectives. So let's be super clear. Your objective is a qualitative goal, right? To become the the best, the simplest, the most efficient the most compelling, um, right? The um, it, it said the single source of truth, whatever you want it to be, right? Yeah. Um, those types of things. Um, and everything should be about the customer, right? So your metrics, this is the other thing that happens a lot, is in your key results, people will sneak in system metrics, mm-hmm. right? They're like, well, it's, there's a metric in there and it's a percentage, like you said, Jeff. Yeah. Okay, great. But the what, what, you, what you put in there was reduce homepage load time by 90%. Yeah, right. That doesn't actually show that people are interacting more. Well, exactly, right? And and so and so homepage load time is a feature of your website. How fast how fast your homepage loads is a feature of your website. If and so the question, when you see that pop up and it's going to pop up, say, great. If we reduce homepage load time, which we can do infinitely, by the way, it can always be faster, right? What is the behavior change we hope to see? Well, we want to see bounce rate go down. There you go. Right? Reduce bounce rate for first time visitors. By 90%. Who does what by how much? That's a good key result. So uh, how, how, how do you, um, I guess, combat or fix um, ones that have like very vague metrics, like increase engagement? Oh. That's one of the worst that I see. Yeah. Just stab me in the heart. Uh, <laughs> and it's like, increase customer engagement. Yeah, that, I love that, right? Um, there's so many words like that. It's like the words that, that help us avoid accountability. Exactly. Right? We're going to drive usage. <laughs> yeah. Like what if that increase brand awareness? 
Right, right, right. Like I make fire extinguishers. <laughs> Are we really going to drive increasing use? <laughs> yes. Let's hope not. <laughs> right, exactly. Right. And so, yeah, so, so that's a great question, right? Brand and en- engagement comes up all the time, mm-hmm. right? Increase engagement, customer engagement, brand engagement. Cool. So uh, I want to talk about that one and talk about another one that comes up all the time as well. So, so people say um, increase engagement. Okay, great. What do engaged customers do? Right. That's oh. a great question, right? An engaged customer does what? Well, engaged customer logs in at least three times a week. Okay, there we go. That's uh, who does what by how much. What else do they do? Um, they spend, on average, they spend at least 12 minutes per session. Okay, there we go, right? So we, we ask those questions. What does an engaged customer do, right? Or, or, or you can ask, the, you, you can ask the, the, the opposite of that. What does a disengaged customer do, right? Well, they visit, at, at most, they visit once a month. Okay. Mm. Increase average site visits, right? To at least three times a month, that type of thing, or whatever it is, right? So that's, that's, you always like, what does it, what does an engaged customer do? If someone is aware of our brand, how does that change their behavior? Right. I think that becomes, and, and, and those may be difficult questions to answer and they may be difficult to measure, but that doesn't make them any less valid of a measure of success or a key yeah. result. The, the other one that comes up all the time. This, because this is on every executive dashboard, is customer satisfaction, right? Every organization, in theory, strives to satisfy their customers. And all those organizations who strive to do that uh, attempt to measure customer satisfaction. And, and I appreciate that, right? Um, we all want to satisfy our customers, right? Net promoter score has forever been sort of the, the default measurement of customer satisfaction. It's a flawed system. Its inventor has denounced it but we keep using it for whatever reason. Um, and it's on executive dashboards. Okay, great. We want to increase customer satisfaction, which is great, but satisfaction is a state of mind. It's not an action. So again, the question comes up again, what do satisfied customers do? Right? Satisfied, satisfied customers renew their subscription every month. They refer their friends, right? They write nice reviews on the internet. That's the kind of stuff we're looking for, or or the opposite. What do dissatisfied customers do? We want to reduce those behaviors. So that's that's the key, I think, to to kind of getting out of that ambiguity. Yeah. So all your metrics must have some kind of action behind it that you can kind of follow back. Yeah. Exa- exactly. Again, who does what by how much? Like like you know, existing customers are thirty five percent more satisfied. Hmm. Like, what does that mean? Like yeah. Like, what are they actually <laughs> doing? Right. Like existing customers increase average order value by 10% on a month over month basis. That's interesting and much more actionable, right? You not, not only can you measure that much more clearly, but if it's not happening, you, you can, it's, it's, you know, exactly kind of where to go to start to look for ways to make that better. Yeah. I feel like, um, having well-written and defined, uh, OKRs helps you in an agile environment because like, if you're building features and you're focusing on features, you may find out that features don't work the way you expected them to. Exactly. And when you go to shift, you know, you're kind of bound based off your goal to build that feature. That's exactly and, right. And, and and look, and I think that that's, that's the thing, right? And I, I've, I've, I've worked with so many great developers over the years. Um, and, you know, it, it, it sucks. It sucks to build something that then people are like, I don't get it. Mm-hmm. Or I don't, I don't need it even worse, right? Like I need it. I can't figure it out is one thing, right? I don't even need it. It's a real punch in the gut, right? You spent a good chunk of your life building this thing, designing this thing, making sure that it works as designed. Um, and so how do we reduce the risk of building things that people don't want or, or can't use? And setting goals, setting customer-centric goals is the first step in that process. Because it doesn't bind us to delivering a thing. And so we, we can go forward and explore and discover the best thing to deliver, the thing that stands the, the greatest chance of success, rather than the thing that somebody told us to build. Yeah, no, I think that's absolutely right. Because I, I can go back to my early days of software development, and we're building tools and we're doing it off of requirements. You know, somebody wrote these requirements down of like, these are the things that it has to have that have to be met. But then when you build it and you deliver it to the customer, they don't use it that way and they don't need it that way. In one example, we, we were building like a, a mobile form to 
basically for, for technicians out in the field to receive trouble tickets, to solve those trouble tickets and to finish them. And they had like a list of requirements. You know, you get all the information, you, you put what you did to fix it, you close the ticket, you know, basic stuff. But it turns out that the guys didn't use it that way. You know, they were used to like waiting to the end of the day to close all their tickets. That way if they needed to go back to a house that they were visited earlier, that they forgot something, you know, they didn't have to reopen the ticket and, you know, to get their driving. And it's just like, you need to follow along with your user and figure out how they're going to use these things and what need to actually have versus what someone wrote down. That was, you know, because I always call it taking a field trip. You need to take a field trip with your customer and kind of learn, you know, get to know them. It's so powerful. I mean, Steve Blank, um, sort of one of the the originators of the lean startup movement and a, and a professor at Stanford for many years, an entrepreneur, et cetera. You know, one of his, you know, pithy phrases was get out of the building. Mm. Yes. Right. The answers to your questions about your product, your service, the whatever it is that, that you're making are not at your desk. They're not in the office. They're not in the building. You've got to take that field trip. You got to go to where your customers are and, and observe them. Right. If, like, for example, I, I did um did a training years ago at uh, at Victoria's Secret. Everyone's like, ooh, like the, su- <laughs> like the supermodels are, are are building the website. Not that they couldn't, right? But they aren't, right? It's it's just another tech team, right? And uh, and so, um, you know, and and I was working with these kind of back end engineers who were just making assumptions about how to structure the data that supplies the search results, and we grabbed them by both hands <laughs> and dragged them out of the building. And to a Victoria's Secret store, and we made them, we didn't force them to talk to the shoppers because they were terrified of that. But what we made them do was sit there and take notes while somebody else led a conversation with a shopper at a store, right? How do you think about the products in the store? What are you looking for? How do you know where to look for it? What do you call it? Like all of these different things, because that information is so valuable to then structuring the data so that when that same shopper goes online and they're searching for something, they get relevant results. Yeah. And the only way to know that is to take that field trip. Yeah, no, absolutely right. I think one of my favorite stories about taking a field trip is, um, and I've used this in many talks before, is a guy named Doug DT. He designed MRI machines. And he you know, made this MRI machine you know, to all the specs that were necessary, all the things that the doctor said they wanted. And then he decided to go watch it in use. And the first place he went to go watch it in use was at a pediatric hospital. And he goes there and watches and all the children had to be either sedated or like they were crying because it was so scary looking on the machine. It didn't, it wasn't like welcoming for them. So just being able to be, see that. And he was able to go back and like painting his pirate sheet ship uh, themed and things like that and put like music in there. So it wasn't so loud and you know, sterile looking and it looked more like an inviting place that was cool to kind of go into, or maybe had one of them painted like a cave. So like, oh, I get to climb into this cave and lay there still and hide, you know, made it more entertaining for children. And just those little, little changes by going out there and visiting him made a much more pleasurable experience and tolerable experience for what was already a stressful time for children. Yeah. It's a great story. And, and it's, and it's amazing, right? How, you know, and, and, and we talk about this a lot, like, well, you know, the, the, when you learn stuff, you have the option to kill, pivot, or persevere, right? So you oh, yeah. kill your idea, pivot off the idea, or persevere with it. And and many times, you don't have to kill the idea, right? It's just little tweaks that make such fundamental differences, right? How do we design the experience for a child inside an MRI machine to make it less less intimidating and less scary, right? How do we design, um, you know, a uh, I have an electric car. Right, and then you drive around town, and every every public charger is run by a different company, right? So how can I get up and running and charging uh, more quickly? Because that's gonna that's gonna give me preference for the chargers that I know I can use more quickly, right? Think think things of that nature um, that where the the product is necessary or the product is valuable, but just a few tweaks to the user experience make all the difference in how successful our customers are. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's uh, I think it's a, a good note to wrap up on. But um, you, you know, I think it's been a great conversation, and I definitely want to uh, encourage people to go check out your book. Um, how can people connect with you online? Maybe pick up a copy of it and learn more about OKRs. Excellent. So, um, so I'm super easy to find. You can find me at Jeff Got Health on LinkedIn. You can go to my website, JeffGotHealth.com. The book's on Amazon, but the easiest way to find it is OKR-Book.com. It's just that's the URL, OKR-Book.com. Um, but 
even just a simple Google of my name, you'll find me and, uh, and please connect. I'd love to hear from you. Awesome. I'll link that too in the show notes at uh, geekleader.com so you can click through and uh, purchase a book and connect with you. Uh, Jeff, this has been a great conversation. Really appreciate having you on. Hope you enjoyed the show. Please go to geekleader.com to learn more about what this guest is up to, click on their links, and connect with them online. I would also greatly appreciate it if you could leave me a rating and review in Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to the show. Make sure you've subscribed if you haven't already. And if you feel so inclined, you can leave me a tip by going to geekleader.com slash tip.